Our scripture lesson for today comes to us from Psalm 8. Listen now for God's word to the church. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. Here are some fun facts for you. Globally, the average abundance of native plant life and animal life has fallen by 20% or more, mainly over the past century. More than 40% of insect species are declining and a third are endangered. Half Half of the topsoil on the planet has been lost in the last 150 years. All the major coral reefs in the ocean are projected to be gone in 30 years. An estimated 18 million acres of forest, which is roughly the size of the country of Panama, are lost each and every year. Humanity has wiped out 60% of animal populations just since 1970. Under a moderate warming scenario, 2.25 billion more people could be at risk for dengue fever by 2080. According to the World Bank, 800 million people in South Asia alone will see their current living conditions sharply diminish by the year 2050. If global temperatures rise by two degrees, 150 million people are likely to die from air pollution. And since 2008, an average of 24 million people have been displaced by catastrophic weather disasters each year, and 143 million people could be displaced by 2050. Well, happy Father's Day, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Just kidding. Maybe you, like me, want to brush these facts off with a joke. Maybe you, like me, want to ignore these facts. It's all too big. It's all too daunting. It seems too far off. It's easier to think about how you might soon be hanging out by the grill on this Father's Day afternoon. But if your fathers were anything like mine, they probably taught you that you don't get to put your feet up until you've put away things in their proper place. Good fathers don't take their Sunday nap when the roof is leaking. Good fathers don't shrug their shoulders when their children are in danger. Good fathers and good mothers teach their daughters and sons that when something is entrusted to them, they take good care of it. They teach them that when you are put in charge of something, you look after it carefully. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. The truth is we are in a crisis because something that has been entrusted to our care is being destroyed. Something that is entrusted to our safekeeping is nearly broken beyond repair, and we are to blame. Now, before I go any further, I want to make something clear. If you don't want to hear some hippie environmentalist sermon from this pulpit, if you don't want to hear some political leftist issue from this pulpit, the good news is you don't have to. I don't want to hear one of those either. This isn't an environmentalist sermon. This isn't a conservative or liberal sermon. This is a Christian sermon because this is a Christian issue. 
I have a friend who works closely with environmental issues, and he says he cringes every time someone calls him an environmentalist. I'm not an environmentalist, he says. I'm a Christian. We are called to this work because our faith calls us to this work. And we have been negligent as a people in caring for one of our most ancient tasks. Our scriptures are steeped with a call to care for creation. We just have been pretending like they don't exist. Don't believe me? Here's a quick sampler. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Genesis 2. If you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Leviticus 18. In the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. The land is to have a year of rest. Exodus 23. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me you are but aliens and tenants. Throughout the land that you hold, you shall provide for the redemption of the land. Leviticus again. You shall not pollute the land in which you live. You shall not defile the land in which you lived, in which it I also dwell, for I the Lord dwell among the Israelites. Numbers 35. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? Must you also trample your, the rest of your pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the water with your feet? Ezekiel 34. I could go on, but you get the point. Christians have for far too long been silent on this issue, or at worst have exacerbated it by misreading our scriptures and defending the plunder of our world. People often tell me that God gave us the the earth to use however we want. They are wrong. Nothing is farther from the truth, and this is a gross misrepresentation of Scripture. Take our lesson for today. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas." So party on, right? It's all ours, right? All things are under our feet, so drill, baby, drill. Wrong. To have dominion over something does not mean to abuse it. To be in charge of something does not mean to destroy it. To have something in your care doesn't give you the right to do whatever you want. In fact, the same word to use to describe dominion in the Old Testament is the same word used to describe how a parent should watch over their family. Good parents don't abuse or destroy those things which they ought to protect. This is obvious. Yet our dominion of the earth has not been this way. All of God's creation has been put under our feet and we have trampled it underfoot. Our heel is on its throat, and we do not realize that if we, do, if we put any more pressure, we'll destroy not only a great inheritance and a gift from God, but the very thing that sustains our neighbors and ourselves. So here's the deal. Um, I get it. I'm a big hypocrite when it comes to this stuff. I often do things contrary to what I believe. I know we have to do something about this crisis, but I still drive an SUV, and I ride in planes, and I run my air conditioner on full blast. Wendell Berry, arguably the most important writer and thinker alive today, calls the environmental crisis a crisis of character. I think he's right. When we know what is good, but do what we hate, that is sin, according to St. Paul. Our first reading from Romans for today gives us a remedy to this crisis of character. Paul writes, Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. The good thing about character is that it can be learned. If we are in this environmental mess because of a crisis of character, it must be character that gets us out of it. Character produces hope, and that hope will not disappoint. On the one hand, the fact of the matter is that individual actions on climate change change practically nothing in the big scheme. 
whether I drive my Jeep or ride my bike or hop a plane or run up my electric bill, practically makes zero difference in a world of 7.7 .7 billion people. Individual changes mean nothing on a global scale, yet the Christian narrative doesn't let me off the hook. Because we are not called to be effective, we are called to be faithful. And God willing, God takes our faithfulness and makes it effective. I heard a story on the radio this past week about a study looking at what motivates people to change their consumption habits. So this is what they did. They asked 4,000 households to conserve power at home. The first 1,000 were asked to conserve power because it's sustainable. It's good for the planet. The second 1,000 households were asked to conserve power because they should think about their children and their grandchildren in the future. The third 1,000 were told how much uh, money they could save by cutting their consumption. And the 4,000 were told how much they used compared to their neighbors. And each time this study was conducted, they found that the largest and most sustainable drop in power consumption was in that fourth group, those who compared themselves to their neighbors. The fact of the matter is that for better or worse, communities shape habits. Our individual choices don't amount to much on their own, but when we are faithful, think about what we could do. The church is supposed to be a model to the world. If our church community began to be a model of care and concern for creation as part of its Christian witness, think how that might change Greensboro. And think about how if Greensboro changed, how this might change North Carolina, and so on. Think about if churches took this seriously all around the world. Snowball effects don't always have to be a bad thing. Then again, maybe this is all too idealistic. Maybe it's all too late. The Presbytery has recommended that we read The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. We have copies in our library. It doesn't paint an optimistic picture of our future given the realities of climate change. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. Maybe God is entrusting us with far too much. But our trust is that character produces hope and hope does not disappoint, not when God's spirit is at work. Last weekend, I had the opportunity to go on our new elder retreat. And I was struck that in one of the sessions, members were asked where they were happiest and most alive, where they were closest to God. And as I listened to their answers, almost every single member said that they were happiest when they were in creation. Walking the beach, being in the mountains, fishing, playing golf, running, gardening, all in creation. We know in our bones how precious creation is and how it helps us relate to our creator. Creation points us to praise. When scholar Walter Brueggemann writes on Psalm 8, he says this, it is not naive to say that the first step in addressing the environmental crisis is to praise God, for praising God is the act of worship and mode of existence that reminds us that human beings are not free to do whatever our science and technology enable us to do. Praise flies in the face of our culture's tendency to unrestrained exploitation. Perhaps then, the best thing we can do is be wowed by God's creation regularly so we, we remember why we need to take care of such an incredible gift. Today's psalm begins and ends with praise. So should we. It's Father's Day. I think about my father and how he taught me to love creation and how he modeled for me what it means to take care of that which has been entrusted to you. I think about how even when he was dying of cancer, the way he would find peace was picturing himself in one of the trout streams he loved to fish. That's how he'd fall asleep at night. I think about how much beauty and grace in the world remains and how important it is that we take care of what God has put underneath our feet. I'll say this Father's Day is also a first for me. My wife and I are expecting our first child this November. 
And I have to say that when I heard that heartbeat for the first time, I can't quite explain it, but something within me changed. And I wonder, what sort of world will my child inherit? Two weeks ago, I was on a wilderness canoe trip in the boundary waters of northern Minnesota. It is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And as I paddled on those chain lakes and I took in those sunsets and star-filled skies, I thought about our future baby. I thought about how I hope we can protect creation so that my child can feel as close to their creator as I do when I'm in places like that. I thought about what a beautiful world we have. And I thought about how I hope my wife and I can teach our children what it means to take care of what we have been entrusted with. I hope we can model it. I hope their church can model it. You have placed all things under our feet. May we be up to the task. Amen.